Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So today's case is yet another case that involves a parent who seems to just want to get revenge on the other parent so bad that they are willing to put their own children's lives at risk. I have covered the cases of the Powell family and the Skelton brothers here on my channel and this case has a lot of similarities to those cases but this case actually happened in Canada and it actually happened over 20 years ago and it remains unsolved to this day. I make this video in hopes that I can bring awareness to these boys in hopes that maybe somebody will recognize them, maybe realize that they saw them at some point and maybe come forward with information. Maybe these boys don't even realize that they're missing and someone will recognize them and will bring them forward or come forward with information. This case definitely needs more awareness because I haven't really seen anyone else cover it on this platform so with that being said, let's just jump right into this case. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearances of the O'Brien brothers. So the oldest of the three brothers is Adam. He was born on October 28, 1982 and was the oldest of the three boys and was 14 years old at the time of the disappearance. Next, we have Trevor, who was born May 8, 1985 and was only 11 years old when he disappeared. And last, but definitely not least, we have Mitchell, who was born on November 29th, 1991, and was only four years old when him and his brothers disappeared. Their parents are Gary O'Brien and Deanna Boland, and the family lived in Torbay, Newfoundland in Canada. Now, we actually don't know a ton about the family dynamics or Deanna and Gary's marriage, which is unfortunate because that could give us a lot more insight into this case in general and why everything happened and how everything happened the way that it did. But either way, overall, Gary O'Brien was described as being quiet, introverted, resourceful, and was known to enjoy going to video game arcades and going to the swimming pool. And he worked as an electrician having a special interest in computers and emerging technology. We also know that Gary did not have a very good mental state to say the least. He had a history of violence, which I also can't really elaborate on because I couldn't really find any further information on that. He also apparently had suicidal tendencies and had other psychiatric problems. Again, I cannot elaborate on those things because there's just no information on that. So I'm assuming because of his violent tendencies and his mental health problems, when him and Deanna got divorced, he did not have custody of the children and he was only allowed visitation. So because of how little we know about the family and the boys in general, I am just going to jump right into the day that the boys disappeared. Now, November 9th, 1996 started as a pretty normal day. It was a very busy morning and the two older boys, Adam and Trevor, were on a paper route delivering newspapers. Apparently, Trevor had just gotten a new Chicago Bulls jersey and he was so excited to show it to his father that day. Adam was getting ready to get his mother a birthday card and he was looking forward to giving that to her soon. They just seemed like such sweet boys who loved their family and they loved their mother and father very much. Now, this day in particular was a Saturday, which was the day that the boys got to see their father. He had visitation rights on Saturdays every weekend and this Saturday was no different. So the routine was that he would drive over to pick up the boys in Deanna's home in Mount Pearl and then take them to his house in Torbay for the day. So he would usually pick them up in the morning and then bring them back that evening. However, this day, Gary actually called Deanna and explained that he would be a little bit late in picking up the boys for the day. But Deanna actually told him that Mitchell, the youngest, wasn't feeling very well that day and said that maybe it would be best if the boys just stayed home that day. I mean, he was only four years old. Obviously, when four-year-olds are sick, they are not very pleasant and they're a little dramatic and they just don't want to do anything. But Gary immediately got very irritated at this suggestion and insisted that the boys start getting ready to be picked up soon. Soon after, Gary showed up and picked up the boys. Deanna said her goodbyes and the four were on their way. However, 
Little did Deanna know, but she would never see Gary or her three sons ever again after this. Now, that evening, Deanna was sitting there waiting for Gary to drop the boys back off at the home like normal, but he was running a lot later than expected. But then by 8.30 p.m., Deanna had received the most terrifying call a mother could ever imagine receiving. Gary called Deanna and told her that he was not going to be returning the children, that she was never going to see them again, and said that he had actually rigged his house with booby traps so that if anyone tried to get into the home, that the home would explode. Of course, Deanna immediately demanded to speak to her three sons because at this point, she thought that her boys were alive and that Gary was just holding them hostage in his house and that, you know, he was threatening them with these booby traps so that no one would come to the house to try and intervene. But as soon as she asked to speak to them, Gary just cut her off and said later, and then just hung up the phone. Deanna said that after this phone call, her whole body just went into a state of shock, understandably. She didn't know what to do or what to think, and so she just immediately collapsed on the floor and started sobbing uncontrollably. Now, he did have a history of threatening to take the children away from her, and again, he did have a history of violence and she didn't want the boys to go over to his house this day in the first place. So she immediately knew that something horrible was happening. Luckily at this point, Deanna was with her sister, so her sister was able to take control of the situation and she immediately called police. Police rushed over to Gary's home only to find out that this bomb threat was very real. Police found two 400-pound tanks of propane hooked up to the home in a way that it would have exploded if anyone tried ringing the doorbell. This was a very, very intricate and complex bomb, and police said that if it had ignited, the blast would have been enough to completely destroy the home and damage all of the surrounding homes in the neighborhood. Deanna believes that he was able to create these traps because of his skills as an electrician. So of course, when police got there, they diffused the bomb and went inside the home to search for them, but neither Gary or the boys were anywhere to be found. Police had assumed that Gary had gone somewhere with the boys, driving his 1989 gray Ford Tempo since the car was not in the driveway where it should have been. Now, police had absolutely no indication to where he could have taken them. But I will mention that Newfoundland is actually an island so the thought at this point was that there was no way that he could have left this island with the boys. He would have needed to take a boat or a plane. So they had time to find them because they honestly could not get very far. So that really did give them hope that they would be found pretty quickly and easily. But despite their exhaustive searches, none of them were anywhere to be found. At this point, it was a national manhunt, so police issued felony arrest warrants for kidnapping, for attempted murder, and for crimes against life and health. Despite police constantly searching, nothing really happened in the case until about a year after the disappearance in October of 1997. Police had actually been conducting a search with a dive team searching for any possible evidence of Gary or the boys, and they actually found something huge. The engine assembly to a 1989 Ford Tempo was found in the ocean near Flat Rock, which is about 10 kilometers or about six miles away from where the boys went missing. So police went ahead and ran the serial number for this car part, and sure enough, it did belong to Gary's 1989 Ford Tempo. So of course they continued searching around the area to see if they could find anything else, but they found absolutely nothing. Now, as I was researching, I was actually able to use a VPN um, thanks to Surfshark VPN, and I was able to set my location to Canada. So I found a bunch of different sources that I normally would not have been able to find. 
um, with a US location. And I actually listened to a Canadian podcast, which I will link below, but the host of the podcast had actually been to Newfoundland and she has been to the cliffs that outlook the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I don't know in this podcast if she was exactly referring to that same cliff where the engine was found, or if it was a different cliff that just had you know similar depths, um, but she explained that the Atlantic Ocean is very, very rough. It's very choppy and very dark. There was also a Redditor who claimed to be on the search team when this engine was found, and he explained that it's not very out of the ordinary to only find one piece of a car, even if the entire car had gone into the ocean. So first of all, considering the impact of the car, if it went flying off the cliff into the ocean, plus how choppy the ocean is, it's possible that the pieces could have just broken apart on impact and then washed away from the very choppy current. So of course this leads to a theory that we will be discussing later, but this could mean that the entire car went into the ocean at some point. However, Deanna believes that both the booby trap and the engine found in the ocean are both ploys by Gary that were set up to throw police off of his trail. She thinks that despite his past of threatening to harm himself, that he definitely would not have harmed the boys in this way. But again, we will get more into this later. Now, the following year after they found the car engine, police actually received an anonymous tip from a woman in Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is actually almost 4,000 kilometers or 2,500 miles away from Flat Rock, so completely across the country. This woman called in saying that she recognized these boys from their missing flyers. Now, this tip did seem pretty credible because she actually knew some of the family intimate details, including a nickname of one of the boys that had not been released. She said that she had actually babysat the boys for Gary. However, police made numerous attempts to try and find her or try and get a hold of her to see if she had any more information to give over the next two years. They even went public with this information to see if anyone could come forward or if she could call in again, but they still could not figure out a way to reach her. So by 1999, two years later, they pretty much just gave up on trying to locate her and finding out this information. But police did think that this tip was very reliable and have said that they now believe that Thunder Bay is the boys' last known locations. After this, there have been more tips that have come in, more sightings of the boys everywhere from all the way across Canada into the United States, but none of them have been credible enough to cause any movement in the case. The case is still considered open and is being looked into to by Interpol, and there is still a $50,000 reward set out to any information leading to finding the boys. Police have said that there are still leads coming in to this day that they are actually looking into, but of course they can't say for sure where they think the boys are or what they think happened to them. As for Deanna, the years after the boys disappeared were very rough to say the least. She spent five years completely isolating herself from the world and completely refused to leave her home. She felt completely numb for so long and found herself unable to care for anything or anyone because she just felt so guilty that she was unable to protect her children and keep them out of harm's way. But after a while, of course, thankfully, she realized that she needed to learn how to cope. She was able to seek professional help and instead of letting the guilt eat away at her, she sought to do something good and became involved in the very organizations that were set up to help find children just like her sons and so many other missing children across North America. At this point, different family members all have different beliefs about what they think could have happened to the boys and whether or not they believe they're still alive. Deanna is very adamant that her boys are still alive and that she will see them again, while other family members just aren't so confident. So now I'm going to go ahead and get into all of the theories in this case. So the first, I guess, set of theories is that Gary had taken the lives of his three sons 
Adam, Trevor, and Mitchell. The first main theory is like we discussed earlier that Gary had taken his car and then drove off of this cliff with himself and his three boys inside taking his own life as well as the lives of his three sons. Like I mentioned earlier, it could be very possible that the car went over the cliff and that the current was so rough that the car just broke apart and went who knows where else in the ocean. So within this theory, we have to consider a few different factors. First of all, we don't know when the car would have driven off the cliff. The engine was not found for an entire year after the disappearance, so theoretically, the car could have driven off the cliff at any point during that year. So let's say that he took the boys and drove off the cliff the same day that he took them and, you know, the car had an entire year to dismantle and rust away the car parts as well as the four bodies being taken away by the current. I do think that this is possible given that the only thing found was the engine. The other thing that kind of fits into this overall theory of Gary taking their lives that day is that Gary was probably setting up the bomb in his house before picking up his boys and never even took his boys to the house in the first place. Now, like we said at the beginning of the video, he called Deanna saying that he was going to be late to picking up the boys that day. It's very possible that the reason he was late was because he was setting up this bomb. I personally don't think that he would have been doing something else that day that made him late and then took them back to the home and then had them in the home and then set up the bomb and then had the boys all there. I feel like someone, you know, maybe would have gotten outside or gotten a hold of someone unless he tied them up and that's a whole nother aspect to this theory, but I personally don't think that he brought them to the home to then build the bomb right in front of them. I think this was set up before he even picked up the boys. Who knows how far in advance, but I personally think that morning, just because he said he was running late, where he could have been constructing it for weeks, who knows, but I think it was his plan to do it before and then call Deanna and let her know so that police would go straight to the house to find it, wasting hours upon hours for him to be able to drive away and either go into the ocean or somewhere else far, far away without being noticed. However, to me, there are a few things that do point away from him taking their lives right away the same day. So, first of all, this area was very close to where the boys went missing from and the water was searched pretty much right away and they did not find anything. Now, I will say that according to the podcast I mentioned earlier, the water in the Atlantic Ocean is very, very dark when you look down on it from a cliff. Plus, it's Canada in November. It has to be absolutely freezing cold, probably very difficult to search. However, just given the fact that they ended up finding it in the same spot the next year in October, when it was probably pretty much just as cold, says that they knew how to search this area and they very likely would have at least found something the first time they searched. It just seems kind of weird to me that this engine and the rest of the car would have been washed away and then somehow would have came back to that same exact spot. Could be possible, but I just don't think that seems very likely. Plus, we have this anonymous tip from a woman thousands of miles away saying that she babysat these kids for Gary. To me, both of these factors point away from Gary driving them off the cliff that same day but not necessarily pointing away from the theory altogether. Because again, it is possible that he drove away somewhere else and then hid out for a while, figuring out what to do, and then ultimately decided maybe weeks or months later to drive off the cliff. But I will say something that is pointing me away from this entire theory is that I do think it's kind of weird that this car would dismantle and get taken away, yet for some reason, the engine just sat there for however long. Now, I understand that the engine is probably heavy. I don't know how heavy it is compared to other car parts. I actually know 
absolutely zero about cars or car parts in general, but it does just seem so weird to me that this one specific piece sat there and didn't move or just got washed back to this spot and nothing else was. They found absolutely no trace of anything else in this car or any other car parts. And I just think that's a little bit strange, but again, I don't know anything about cars. So if anyone knows any more about this, then please let me know. But to me, this just seems a little bit weird. Obviously, it does not surprise me if the human bodies were swept away and were taken elsewhere or decomposed because obviously human skin and organs are a lot lighter, they decompose faster, but you'd think that there would be at least a shred of something else somewhere, but there wasn't. So, theoretically, this could point to Gary throwing the engine off into the ocean to throw police off, but we will get into that theory in just a minute. The other theory, I guess within this general theory, is that Gary had done pretty much everything like we mentioned before with him setting up the bomb as a decoy to steer police away from him, but maybe Gary went somewhere, took the lives of his three sons, and then buried them somewhere or maybe even threw them into the ocean, then somehow found a way to leave Newfoundland. It's possible that Gary either rented a new car and was able to drive that car onto a ferry, which took him across the water into the mainland of Canada, and then went who knows where in Canada to hide out. Maybe someone close to the family made a faulty tip to throw police off of looking for their bodies, and maybe that's why this woman made this tip and never contacted police again. And then again, maybe Gary was just living off the grid for 20 plus years and nobody recognized him. Now, I think in terms of him taking the kids' lives that it is possible that everything I just described could be possible, but I think that given his history, the very brief history that we know, that he probably would have taken his own life since he does have a history of suicidal tendencies. It's not very common that a parent just wants to straight up murder their children, but at the same time, it has happened. But we don't know, like I said, we couldn't find any sort of detail about these mental health issues that he had or his suicidal tendencies or even his history with violence. So it's not something that I wanna to focus too much, but I do think that it could be worth mentioning. So the next theory is that the boys are still alive to this day. Now, Deanna has stated that she actually believes that Gary dropped the kids off at some sort of religious community, maybe an Amish community, or maybe he dropped them off with some sort of cult and that the reason that the boys have not reached out to her is because they either simply don't have access to technology and are living off the grid because of being in this Amish community, or that they have just been brainwashed either by Gary or by this cult to the point that they no longer want to reach out to her or realize that they're missing people. Either way, she does truly believe that her son's are still alive to this day. Like I mentioned earlier, Deanna believes that him creating this entire bomb and then leaving the engine in the water were both diversions to throw police off his track. So in terms of him being able to leave, it pretty much makes sense how he did it the way we discussed before. Maybe he managed to rent a car from somewhere and then maybe he threw his engine into the water like we mentioned earlier, or maybe he managed to get his entire car over the cliff without anyone actually being in it. I guess if you accelerate it fast enough and then jump out, you could theoretically do that. Um, or if you had someone to help, I don't really know how he would have done that, but maybe he managed to do it and then rented the car and then of course got into the ferry and then got into the mainland and then got away that way. And then during all of this, at some point, he dropped his children off at some sort of religious organization or a cult, and they've all just been living there ever since, or maybe Gary is with them in this cult or religious organization. The other theory within the theory of the kids still being alive, of course, is that he has just taken them all the way across the country and has been living with them off the grid this entire time. So one of the main things that points to him doing this 
is the witness who called saying that she babysat the children. Now, I totally think it's possible that if he left the boys for a few days or something to try and get things figured out before coming back and picking them up, that he would have left them with a trusted babysitter because I do think that if, you know, it was only gonna be a couple hours and this was, you know, a normal babysitting time frame, like a couple hours, I think that Adam is old enough to watch the other two boys because he was 14 years old at the time. But obviously, if you are leaving your kids for several days, you're not going to leave a 14 year old in charge. Plus, we don't know how long this was planned for or maybe if it was a spur of the moment thing. We don't know if he literally woke up that day and decided that this is what he was going to do. So no matter how much planning I think he put into it, I think that he probably would have needed time to try and figure everything out once he got to where he wanted to be and then maybe he left his kids with this woman while he went and bought a apartment or got a job. I don't I don't know what else he would need to do, but as he's figuring things out, he left them with this babysitter. I do think that it's very telling that this woman from all the way across the country, 4,000 kilometers across the country, called and said that she babysat these boys. That just seems a little bit too random to be made up. Plus, we know that it is totally possible to just get up and start a new life with no trace. We just saw that in the Richard Hoagland video where he disappeared for 26 years without a single trace because he was able to figure out a way to create an entire new identity for himself. Now, granted, it would be much harder to do with four entire people and three of them being children, but I think it's totally possible, especially that this was the 1990s, things probably weren't tracked as much, it was probably a lot easier to live off the grid. The things that are kind of pointing me away from this theory though is that why would he throw his engine, of all things, into the ocean? How would he have known that someone was going to find this? Like I said earlier, it's a very dark and choppy ocean and him knowing that there's no way that he could have been confident that they'd for sure find it. I don't know for sure and also would have to ask when did he throw this engine into the ocean? Was it right away before he left? Did he, did he come back and do it? We don't really know. Maybe he somehow found out that they were going to search this area and then threw it in right before but I just don't know. So the last sort of, not really a theory on its own, but another thought is that the boys are still alive, that he did drop them off in some sort of Amish religious community or a cult, something similar, but then he went off somewhere else and then took his own life, basically using all of the information and thoughts from before, but maybe he made this bomb to, of course, be a distraction to go ahead and go drop off the boys wherever he was going to drop them off, and then he took himself and drove off the cliff. It's very possible that if his main goal was to just get these boys away from their mother to hurt her, but didn't actually want to hurt them, but he wanted to hurt himself, it's very possible that this is what he could have done. It's very possible that if he had these suicidal tendencies, that instead of taking all of their lives, that he just dropped them off with someone who he knew that she would never find them again and then took his own life. I do think that this is very possible, especially given the fact that they have never reached out to their mother. And again, the reason might just be because they were brainwashed by some sort of cult, or maybe they're stuck in this cult and can't leave even if they want to. Or maybe again, they're in an Amish community and don't have any access to any resources. Either way, at this point, it's been almost 26 years that Deanna has had to live without having any idea of what happened to her precious three boys. Adam would be turning 38 this year in October. Trevor would be 35 as of May and Mitchell would be turning 29 in November. I personally think the two theories that involve him driving off the cliff are the most possible. I think he either dropped them off with someone because he didn't want to hurt his own sons and then drove himself off the cliff or he drove off the cliff with all three of his sons. I do think it's possible that he did take all of their lives because 
I think that Adam and Trevor were both old enough to very clearly remember their mother and while yes, they could have been brainwashed, I just feel like it's so many years later that they would have reached out to her. I don't know, it might just be me and I can't speak for the decisions or mindset of others or how they might have been influenced. So it's always possible that Deanna is 100% right and that they are still out there somewhere, but I just don't know if I want to believe that, but we don't know for sure. Mitchell, Trevor, and Adam O'Brien all went missing with their father, Gary O'Brien, on November 9th, 1996 from Newfoundland in Canada. At the time of their disappearances, Mitchell was three feet tall, weighing 47 pounds with brown hair and blue eyes, and would now be 29 years old. Trevor was four feet eight inches, weighing 70 pounds, also with brown hair and blue eyes, and would now be 35 years old. Adam was five feet two inches, weighing 100 pounds, with with brown hair and blue eyes and would now be 38 years old. As for Gary, he is wanted in relation to his son's abductions. He was 40 years old at the time of their disappearances and would be turning 24 in October of this year. He also has blue eyes and has gray hair. If you have absolutely any information about Mitchell, Trevor, or Adam O'Brien, please contact the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-843-5678 or the Royal Newfoundland Police at 1-709-729-8000. As always, those numbers will be listed down in the description box below, but that is all I have for today's video, and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that the boys are still alive out there? Do you think Gary is still out there somewhere? Or do you think that their lives were taken by their father? Please let me know your theories in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Also, don't forget to check out my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send them to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.